If I put 10 balls in a box, then take out one, then put 10 more balls in the box and take out one, then complete this process infinitely many times, how many balls do I have left in the box? Well, infinity, wait, zero? These are infinity paradoxes which show the unintuitive nature of infinity by forming contradictions in mathematics. The example you saw at the start is completely true with no tricks or foul play, and you'll see how at the end. But first, what is a paradox? Well, there are three main types of paradoxes, falsitical, veridical, and antinomy. Take for example Zeno's paradoxes. Say Achilles and a tortoise start a race 100 meters apart from each other. At some point, Achilles would have reached the point where the tortoise was, but the tortoise has moved, say, 10 meters. So Achilles moves another 10 meters, but the tortoise has moved one meter. And this will keep happening infinitely many times. So Achilles will never reach up with the tortoise. But this obviously isn't true. Achilles will catch up with the tortoise at around 112 meters, and at twice the time, he'll be well past the tortoise. You see, what Zeno didn't know is that an infinite series could converge to a single finite value. So with the exception of a few philosophers, most people agree this is false, making it a falsitical paradox. But unlike falsitical paradoxes, veridical paradoxes are problems that initially seem wrong, but are proven to be true. Things like the Monty Hall paradox, the potato paradox, and the string girdling earth paradox have nothing logically contradictory about them, but are still called paradoxes. This has made a lot of my viewers mad, but it's still a valid use of the word. So here's an example with infinity. There are as many even numbers as there are even and odd numbers. What? This clearly can't be true because all even numbers are even or odd numbers, and there are even or odd numbers that aren't even. So even numbers are a proper subset, meaning they can't be the same size. But infinity doesn't play fair. So we have to look at something called cardinality, or the size of a set. If we can map every element in a set A to another set B, such that every element in B is mapped to, we have what's called a bijection. Now, if we have a bijection between two sets, they must be the same size. In the case of natural numbers, we call the size Aleph null, all sets with this cardinality are called countably infinite. Some examples are integers, rational numbers, and even numbers. So let's form a bijection between positive even numbers and natural numbers. We can do this by mapping each natural number to two times its value in the even numbers. We'll find that each even number is mapped to, and each natural number maps to an even number. Hence we have a bijection between even numbers and even and odd numbers. So we can conclude that there are as many even numbers as there are even and odd numbers. Nothing's contradictory about this, but it sure is counterintuitive. Now I think we've stretched the word power paradox enough, so let's get to some real ones. These are antinomy paradoxes, where two reasonable statements contradict each other. The simplest example is the lies paradox. This statement is false. If the statement's true, then it must be false, but if it's false, then it must be true. There's no resolution to this statement, its existence contradicts itself. So with this in mind, let me show you my favorite paradox, the Ross Littlewood paradox. Say I have an empty box, I'll start by grabbing 10 balls, and then putting them into the box. I'll then take out one ball. I'll then take another 10 balls, put them into the box, and then take out one ball. I'll then repeat this process infinitely many times. You'd expect my box to have infinitely many balls because at every step I'm putting in more than I'm taking out but there's a completely valid mathematical way to end up with zero balls. Using cardinality as mentioned before, if we have a set of all natural numbers and all multiples of 10, we can form a bijection between these two sets. So in essence, we're putting in just as many balls as we're taking out. Now this isn't a complete proof because forms like infinity minus infinity are indeterminate, but to give you a visual of how it works, let's number our balls. I'll first put in 10 balls numbered one to 10 and remove ball number one. Next I'll put in balls 11 to 20 and remove ball two. As I continue this process, I'm always putting in more balls than I take out, but every ball I put in, I've taken out. Ball number 5,352 was taken out at step 5,352. So that means after infinitely many steps, I have zero balls left, and this is perfectly legitimate mathematics. No tricks, no magic. But that's not the only way we can solve this problem. Say I put in balls 1 to 10 and remove ball number 10. Next, I'll put in balls 11 to 20 and remove ball 20. If I continue this process infinitely many times, I'll end up with infinitely many balls. And this is a paradox. We have two mathematically correct solutions, one with infinitely many balls and one with zero balls, which contradict each other. Okay, but that's stupid. This will take an infinite amount of time. Well, let me introduce you to the idea of a super task. This is where we complete infinitely many steps in a finite amount of time. Take, for example, Thompson's lamp, where I set a timer for two minutes. Turn on a lamp, and after a minute, turn it off. 30 more seconds, turn it on. 15 seconds off, seven and a half on. And continue this process, halving the interval infinitely many times. At two minutes, is the lamp on or off? Well, if we look at this from a math perspective, we can let one be the lamp is on and zero that it's off. Starting with the lamp on, we can subtract Granny series from it, do a bit of math, and find that the answer is one on two? 
The cat's both alive and dead. But my physical light is confined by the binary on or off, and my math was less than rigorous. So let's consult physics. The smallest length of time we consider is Planck time, which is defined as the time it takes a photon traveling at the speed of light to cross a distance equal to one Planck length. Taking smaller and smaller intervals, the state of our light would be that where the time is still greater than a Planck time. But humans can't move that fast. You see, this question lacks essential information. Who's flicking the light? What's the strength of the switch? Can this guy even read a timer? But none of that's really important. This question is devised as a thought experiment where the information given is the information used. And as for the answer, there there is none. It's a logical paradox. So you might be asking now, what's the purpose of these questions? I don't have infinitely many balls, and if I flip my lamp more than once, it'll break. Well, the answer is curiosity. Zeno didn't know that an infinite series could converge to a finite value, so at the time, his paradoxes were seen as antinomy, but now they're completely resolved. So in 100 years from now, our understanding of math could develop enough to solve these infinity paradoxes. Innovation happens because we ask questions, so instead of casting off a question as stupid, try ask another question.